a very good morning class once again i hope you enjoyed my previous lecture and i hope you will enjoy this lecture as well so again i will be teaching you all biology and we will be continuing further last time we learned about rbcs circulation in animals circulation in humans open circulation closed circulation and different types of closed circulation as well that is being single and being double as well so today we are going to go a step ahead now so for this also i have made a ppt with videos and google forms i hope you enjoy it and keep your full uh, participation and be 100% focused with my class so i will start sharing my screen now yes so i am from arihant college of education hope you all remember this is the logo hope you all remember my name as well my name is manpreet kaur gandhi i will be teaching standard 12 and subject biology so our unit for today is circulation and respiration and the sub unit is types of wbcs and the structure of heart what are the different types of wbcs and what is the structure of heart so you will see what is wbc and its types it is colorless nucleated and amoeboid cells amoeboid cells means having no regular shape their shape is irregular they are colorless and they are nucleated means having a nucleus due to their amoeboid movement they can move out of their capillary walls by a process called di diapedesis due to their amoeboid movement that is irregular movement from one place to another they can move out of the capillary walls which are very thin by a process called diapedesis to destroy the germs or the viruses which enter our body and can harm us so they are our soldiers we can say that they are classified into two category that is a granulocytes and granulocytes granulocytes there are different categories in granulocytes neutrophils that contain 70 percentage of the total wbcs responsible for destroying the pathogens by a process called phagocytosis they destroy the pathogens by a process called as phagocytosis so when they move out of the capillary that is called lipidesis and when they destroy the pathogens it is called as phagocytosis kindly note this down in your notebooks and remember the percentage as well now we will see basophils which is another type of granulocytes very few granules of large size and stain with basic stains like methylene blue so they stain with basic stains like methylene blue which are basic in nature about 0.5 to 1 percentage of total wbcs so granulocytes means having granules these are the types of wbcs which have granules in their cytoplasm now we will see eosinophils about 1 to 3 percentage of wbcs nucleus is bilobed a granulocytes means having no granules in their cytoplasm about 28 percentage of wbcs of total wbcs cytoplasm is without granules formed from the lymphoid stem cells and can divide by mitosis lymphoid stem cells i can divide by mitosis lymphocytes consist constitute 25 to 30 percentage of total wbcs it has two types b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes b lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow while t lymphocytes mature in the thymus that is why it is b means in the bone marrow and t that is in the thymus monocytes largest of all the wbcs forms 3 to 5 percentage of total wbcs actively motile and give rise to macrophages okay class so i want you all uh, to i want to mention one more thing in this that you should be sensitive about your body just like rbcs i mentioned that if uh, you don't have a healthy diet same case goes with wbcs as well if your wbc count goes down it will be a very big problem like you might get hospitalized you might uh, have various diseases 
like uh, dengue or something i mean in these diseases either your platelet level goes down or either of these cells goes down so in order to prevent that you should be sensitive and have a healthy diet and be careful always be sensitive and take care of yourself so let us watch a video based on this i hope you all remove your notebooks and remain 100% focused by the end of this session i ensure that you will be inspired as well as tired inspired you will learn a lot of things and tired yes okay you it might be boring it's okay it's medicosis perfectionalis here we are done with anemia. We are going to discuss leukemia. In the previous video, we have talked about the complete blood count. Today, let's talk about the white blood cells in an introduction to leukemia and lymphoma. Coming up, Medicosis perfectionalis. But first, what is the function of your white blood cell? It's the military. It defends your body against foreign invaders. If they went nuts and starting attacking your own body, this is an autoimmune disease. If they went nuts and started dividing repeatedly, excessively in a crazy way, this is called cancer, such as leukemia or lymphoma. Here are your white blood cells. You have neutrophil, which is neutral. Basophil with basophilic granules, eosinophil with eosinophilic granules. We call all of these together granulocytes. Here we have the A granulocytes, no granules. Magnet shaped, magnet horseshoe, monocyte. This is your lymphocyte with very little rim of the cytoplasm left. You cannot differentiate between B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes on the peripheral smear. It's impossible. That's why we need something called flow cytometry, as we will discuss later. Or learning about any topic for the first time, what's the first question? What's the definition of white blood cells? They are cells. Oh, really? Uh -huh, okay, uh -huh, that's, uh, that was nice. Spoiler alert. They are blood cells that are part of the immune system that defends your body against foreign invaders. That's fine. They are nucleated. Unlike red blood cells, which were anucleated, unlike platelets, which are not even cells, platelets are just fragments of the cytoplasm of their parent called megakaryocyte. White blood cells are derived from stem cells called multipotent stem cells. This is their type. It's multipotent hematopoietic stem cells will give you the myeloid lineage and the lymphoid lineage. Myeloid include the red blood cells, the platelets, and some white blood cells, such as neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, and the monocyte. And the lymphoid include the B lymphocyte and the T lymphocyte. See, no distinction by the naked eye using microscopy. That's why we need flow cytometry. Okay, these are the granulocytes. These are the non-granulocytes. Now, if you understand this slide, you will surf through the sea of leukemia and lymphoma seamlessly. So please pay attention. Lococytes, loco means white, site means cells. Some people write it with a K, some use a C. I don't care. Okay. Lococytes, where can you find white blood cells? You can find them in the blood and in the lymph. What is the blood and what's the lymph? That's easy. They are part of your circulatory system. The blood system is a closed system. It starts in the heart and it ends in the heart. So let's do it. From the right side of the heart comes deoxygenated blood to the lung. The lung oxygenates this blood using oxygen that you breathe and returns nice red oxygenated blood to your left side of the heart. 
pump it through the aorta to the rest of your body and then the rest of your body uses blood uses oxygen and produces co2 goes to the superior and inferior vena cava to the right side of your heart welcome back home starts in the heart ends in the heart closed system that's the blood how about the lymphatic system it's not a closed system which means they start at the capillary interface as your blood is getting filtered through these capillaries the cells will stay behind and the plasma will diffuse when the plasma tries to come back some of them or let's say the huge bulk goes through the vein or the venule and a minority of this plasma gets filtered into the lymphatic system the lymphatic system again same reason they fight infection they fight foreigners but they have military bases where there are a lot of the army a lot of the navy a lot of the soldiers there to fight infection these are called lymph nodes that's fine so if you have abnormal white blood cells in your blood this is leukemia abnormal red blood cells in your lymph nodes this is lymphoma period end of issue okay now where is the factory that produces your blood it's called the bone marrow that's why leukemia will be in the bone marrow and in the blood smear so how to diagnose it again get a peripheral smear and get a bone marrow biopsy how to diagnose lymphoma you need a lymph node biopsy we are done okay if you understand this you get the whole concept clearly it's an oversimplification but i'd like you to get a grasp of the basis because some students go mad without knowing the basis oh but i'm confused what's the difference between acute lymphocytic leukemia and non burkitt's lymphoma hey honey calm down understand the basics first goodness gracious leukemia in the bone marrow and in the bloodstream lymphoma in the lymph node okay fine now let's take a blood sample and do centrifugation okay red blood cells are the heaviest the highest density so they go to the bottom okay if you remember anything about physics rbcs are 45 percent of the whole blood okay that's why your hematocrit was 45%. Hello. Okay. The plasma is lighter, less density. It goes to the top, 55%. Now there is a very teeny, tiny, tiny, less than 1% here called the Buffy coat. It contains both the white blood cells and the platelets. Okay. That's why we called white blood cell white blood cells because they appear white okay here now sometimes this layer appears green why what are the most numerous white blood cells the neutrophils what does they have in them the myeloperoxidase enzyme oh that's why they're green okay talked about the cbc in the previous video we want to know the white blood cells the platelets and the red blood cells if you order a peripheral blood smear, you use a stain called Romanovsky or right. So I hope you've understood enough about WBCs now. Let us go ahead. We'll go with thrombocytes now. Cellular fragments formed from the large cells called megakaryocytes. Basically, thrombocytes are nothing but your platelets, which help in coagulation of your blood. Such as, uh, remember that when you're running or when you fall down or while running when you fall down, when you have an injury, your blood starts clotting, right? It starts becoming uh, hard. It's not liquid anymore, which is this process is done by the thrombocytes. So always think critically about this process, okay? Because if uh, the blood remains in liquid form and it keeps flowing, then we will die. So always think critically about why it is becoming, why it is getting coagulated or why it is turning into a solid form. So this is the reason why. Else, if the blood keeps on flowing, we will die. 
produced in the bone marrow if the number decreases it is called as thrombocytopenia please note the spelling thrombocytopenia blood clotting as i already mentioned process of converting the liquid blood into solid form extrinsic and extrin uh, extrinsic and intrinsic processes involve interaction of various substances called clotting factors thromboplastin helps in the formation of enzyme prothrombinase enzyme inactivates heparin and it also converts inactive prothrombin into its active thrombin thrombin converts fibrinogen into its fibrin so this is the process thromboplastin helps in formation of enzyme prothrombinase then that enzyme inactivates the heparin and also converts it into inactive prothrombin into its active thrombin so when it is inactive it is known as inactive prothrombin and when it gets into active form it is called as active thrombin thrombin converts uh, fibrinogen into fibrin and fibrin forms a mesh in which platelets and other blood cells are trapped to form the clot this is how the clot formation takes place so always think critically about this process So let us watch a video now. Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Nails, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today is the second video in our topic about bleeding and coagulation disorder. In the previous video, we have discussed platelets or thrombocytes. Today, let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about the platelet structure and the platelet granules, the alpha granules and the dense granules. So let's get started. <music> previous video make sure to watch it before this one I've told you that the normal platelet count is 150,000 to 400,000 less than 150 is called thrombocytopenia more than 400,000 is called thrombocytosis or thrombocythemia but we don't care about thrombocytopenia unless platelet count is less than 50,000 and clinically we don't uh, care about thrombocytosis unless it's more than 750,000 so when grandma comes in and her platelet count is 600,000 with no symptoms, I just send her home. Don't worry about it. Provided that everything else is normal. Thrombocytes, the cells of thrombus, less platelets, thrombocytopenia, more platelets, thrombocytosis, or thromb thrombocythemia, synthesized by the glorious, magnificent megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. While squeezing out, these megakaryocytes are destroyed into thousands of pieces. Each piece is called platelet. That's why platelets don't have a nucleus and they cannot divide. They are not cells, they are just pieces. Platelets are just pieces. Where did they get the membrane from? From the membrane of the megakaryocyte. Where did they get the cytoplasm from? From the cytoplasm of the megakaryocyte. They just took a piece. So bone marrow biopsy, you don't get to see platelets. Platelets are only seen in the peripheral smear. Let's talk about platelet structure. First, platelets are biconvex. If you remember the red blood cells, the red blood cells were biconcave. The two surfaces are concave. Platelet is the opposite. The two surfaces are convex. However, they are similar in another thing. Both don't have a nucleus. Both of them are non-nucleated. Platelets are pieces of the megakaryocyte and the structure of platelets. They have the plasma membrane or the cell membrane, which they got from the megakaryocyte, and the cytoplasm that they get also from the megakaryocyte. The plasma membrane or the lipid bilayer. If you remember our discussion about the cell membrane, any cell membrane is a lipid bilayer and it's covered by a glycocalyx. Glycocalyx is just carbohydrate. Platelets are slightly different. Yes, they have the lipid membrane, but they are covered by not carbohydrate, but carbohydrate plus protein. Why protein? Because the active thing in your body is protein. And platelets need receptors 
because they want to bind and adhere to the endothelial tissue, so they need receptors. If they need receptors, they have to be protein. That's why it's not just carbohydrate, it's glycoprotein. And without these receptors, you'll bleed to death. So that's the first layer, glycoprotein coat, and it has the receptors. Two receptors to remember, GP1B and GP2B3A. Some people will write it, GP2B3A like this, doesn't matter to me. The lipid bilayer, including phospholipid, and the phospholipid will produce the famous arachidonic acid, the pro-inflammatory. Actually, it's one of the most pro-inflammatory things in your body ever. Steroids inhibit the formation of arachidonic acid. That's why steroids are the best, the strongest anti-inflammatory known to man. Calcium can enrich your system because platelets need to contract. Why contract in order to release? No pun intended. Cytoplasm, they have actin and myosin again for contraction and release. Thrombostenin, IN means protein. Stenos is Greek for strength. So thrombostenos, the protein that's strong in the platelets, again, is going to contract and release. Release what? Release the granules. Wait, wait. Good things happen to those who wait. Platelets have residuals of Golgi and rough endoplasmic reticulum. Why? For enzyme synthesis. The mighty mitochondria to produce ATP, and of course they need ADP. Fibrin stabilizing factor, also known as factor 30. Platelet-derived growth factor, and it helps repair the vessel after the thrombus. Platelets are thrombocytes. They form the thrombus. But like a good cat, they clean after themselves after the thrombus is over. Your cat defecates in the ground, but then it cleans up after itself, exactly like the platelet. Platelet granules, the ones in the cytoplasm. Alpha granules and dense granules. Alpha granules, they are alpha, they are protein, they are strong, they are active. And they include factor 13, the fibrin stabilizing factor, the platelet activating factor, platelet derived growth factor to help with regeneration and repair, von Willebrand factor, fibrinogen, but isn't fibrinogen a coagulation factor supposed to be formed by the liver? I didn't say that platelets form or create fibrinogen. They just happen to store it. Platelet factor 4 and it will be involved in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia and we'll talk about that later. Dense granules, on the other hand, they are not proteins. Only the alpha are proteins and they include ADP and calcium. Why do you need calcium? Calcium is the hero of contraction, contract and release. Calcium bind agent for vitamin K dependent factor. What are the vitamin K dependent factor. Okay. Remember the um, when we studied the autonomic nervous system, or when you studied the autonomic nervous system, there were four nerves coming out of the brain called cranial autonomic nerves, and those cranial autonomic nerves happen to be parathympathetic. These are three, seven, nine, and ten. I know that three doesn't come from the brain stem; it comes from the midbrain, but forget it. 3, 7, 9, and 10. Vitamin K dependent factor, instead of 3, just put 2. So you have 2, 7, 9, and 10. You don't want to say 2? Say prothrombin. So prothrombin, 7, 9, 10. Any mediocre student will just say 2, 7, 9, and 10. But for pros like you, medicosis viewers, you say 2, 7, 9, and 10, protein C and protein S. Never ever forget this. Prothrombin 7, 9, 10, protein C and S. Prothrombin 7, 9, 10, protein C, protein S. So in cases of vitamin K deficiency, which factors are deficient? 2, 7, 9, 10, C and S. Just quick review, we find platelets in the peripheral blood, but some of them are hiding in the spleen. That's why splenomegaly decreases the platelet count, causing thrombocytopenia. That's why one of the treatment options for, for thrombocytopenia is to remove the spleen, forcing all of the platelets to gather around together in the peripheral blood, raising the platelet count back to normal. In the next video, we'll talk about the arachidonic acid. You don't want to miss it. So I hope you've learned enough about thrombocytes. Let us go ahead. We'll study about the heart now. 
It is enclosed in a membranous sac called as pericardium, which is formed of two main layers, outer fibrous and inner serous pericardium. Okay, membranous sac called pericardium. Parietal and visceral layers of serous pericardium are separated by a per, uh, pericardial space. So parietal and visceral layers of serous pericardium are separated by a pericardial space. The space is filled with a pericardial fluid, which acts as a shock absorber. Okay, so the space is filled by pericardial fluid, which act, acts as shock absorber. Heart is formed of three layers, outer epicardium, middle myocardium, and inner endocardium. Heart is four chambered. Two superior chambers are called atria and inferior are called ventricles. The right atrium re uh, receives superior and inferior vena cava along its dorsal surface. Yeah. So right atrium is receiving superior and inferior vena cava along its dorsal surface. Atria are thin walled receiving chambers of the heart. Thin walled receiving chambers of the heart means they receive the blood. Ventricles are inferior thick walled pumping chambers of the heart. So that is the difference between atria and ventricles. Atria are receiving, ventricles are pumping, they are giving out. And they are thick walled and atria are thin walled. So let us watch a video based on this. And always take care of your heart, eat healthy, exercise daily so that your heart remains active and strong and pumps the blood and you don't suffer from problems like BP or any other thing that is blood pressure okay so always have a healthy diet and be sensitive towards your health hope you all have opened your notebooks before the video starts only a few seconds left, video will start. Your heart is an extraordinary machine. During your lifetime, your heart's muscular walls pump blood into blood vessels branching throughout your body. Your heart has four chambers. Two upper chambers called the left and right atria and two lower chambers called the left and right ventricles contract in a steady rhythm known as your heartbeat. During a normal heartbeat, blood from your tissues and lungs flows into your atria, then into your ventricles. Walls inside your heart, called the interatrial and interventricular septa, help keep the blood on left and right sides from mixing. Two valves sit like doors between your atria and ventricles to prevent blood from flowing backward into your atria. The tricuspid valve opens into your right ventricle and the bicuspid valve, also known as the mitral valve, opens into your left ventricle. Strong, thin tissues called chordae tendinae hold your valves in place during the forceful contractions of your ventricles. Blood leaving the ventricles passes through another set of valves, the pulmonary valve between your right ventricle and pulmonary trunk, and the aortic valve connecting your left ventricle and aorta. In order to pump blood more efficiently, your heart muscle, called myocardium, is arranged in a unique pattern. Three layers of myocardium wrap around the lower part of your heart. They twist and tighten in different directions to push blood through your heart. When special cells, called pacemaker cells, generate electrical signals inside your heart, 
the heart muscle cells, called myocytes, contract as a group. Your heart is divided into left and right halves, which work together like a dual pump. On the right side of your heart, deoxygenated blood from your body's tissues flows through large veins called the superior and inferior vena cava into your right atrium. Next, the blood moves into your right ventricle, which contracts and sends blood out of your heart to your lungs to gather oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. On the left side of your heart, oxygen-rich blood from your lungs flows through your pulmonary veins into your left atrium. The blood then moves into your left ventricle, which contracts and sends blood out of your heart through the aorta to feed your cells and tissues. The first branches off your aorta are the coronary arteries, which supply your heart muscle with oxygen and nutrients. At the top of your aorta, arteries branch off to carry blood to your head and arms. Arteries branching from the middle and lower parts of your aorta supply blood to the rest of your body. Your heart beats an average of 60 to 100 beats per minute. In that one minute, your heart pumps about five quarts of blood through your arteries, delivering a steady stream of oxygen and nutrients all over your body. So I hope you enjoyed this video class. Let's go ahead. So, I want you all to solve a few questions which I have put in this Google form, which will help you in also recapping, uh, in, you know, having a recapitulation of what you have learned and also applying your knowledge. Kindly solve these questions and give me your answers. So after uh, you enter your answers in these questions, you have to click on the submit button. As soon as you click on the submit button, the answers will come to me. I will check and give you, give you the score. Hope you score full marks. So homework for today is you have to do question number two from page number 180 from HSC 12th biology textbook. Question number two from page number 180 from HSC 12th biology textbook. Thank you. And I hope you have a great day ahead. And all the best for your board examinations as well. Have a great day class.